Thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm so excited to welcome Beatrice Williams, and she's going to be here talking about her new book, Husbands and Lovers. Um, Beatrice is a New York Times bestselling author of historical fiction, as I'm sure you all know, um, and one of Connecticut's own. Beatrice's books, which include The Summer Wives, The Beach at Summerlee, and The Golden Hour, have won numerous awards, have been translated into more than a dozen languages, and appear regularly in bestseller lists around the world. Um, Martha Hall Kelly, the New York Times bestselling author of The Golden Dove, said, I loved Husbands and Lovers and devoured it in one delicious gulp. I was so invested in Mallory and Monk. It is my favorite kind of page turner, unputdownable. And Booklist said, A captivating novel of love and love lost, with well drawn characters and sweeping drama, William's latest is a gripping journey as secrets and hidden desires are exposed. So without further ado, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming here on this beautiful uh, Monday evening. Uh, I, Monday is, uh, you know, I, it, it's usually not my first choice for, uh, you know, a launch event, but here we are. Books are always, did you know, books are always out on a Tuesday for whatever reason in the publishing calendar. So uh, we're allowed to do one event before the book is officially out. And so here we are, you know, you know buy and read it in, you know, stay up all night reading it. And you're thinking ahead of everybody else who has to get theirs tomorrow. Uh, anyway, so like I said, thank you for coming. Thank you very much to RJ Julia for hosting this event. Uh, I'm sure you've heard authors say before how much we love independent booksellers. RJ Julia is one of the best. So thank you for supporting uh, this wonderful independent bookseller right in our neck of the woods. Uh, so how many of you have heard me speak before? Okay, so I will try not to go too far and repeat all my jokes with my sort of origin story. Um, but I do need to go back into that a little bit and refresh everyone. Sorry, I'm like a warmer, so I'm gonna like wander a bit. Um, because I do want to refresh your memory on this because with husbands and lovers, we definitely go back into that um that world of Winter Island that I first created in my book. Uh, the Summer Wives, uh, which uh, I'm sure those of you uh, in this area know of Fisher's Island because it's right not too far away from here. Uh, it's really fun when I get to go around the South because they haven't heard of Fisher's Island. So I, I get to tell them all about this and why haven't we heard of this before? And I'm like, well, because that's the way that Fisher's Islanders like it. Uh, they don't want you to know about their island. And we were actually having a very interesting discussion of, uh, I guess, the, the green room um, upstairs about uh, about that sort of island culture and that that tension between uh, the need to change because you can't keep things preserved uh, forever, but also that that desire to conserve this very special culture that you have there and the reason that you uh, and your family keeps coming back year after year. So I'm just going to spin it back a little because I'm not, when you say I am one of Connecticut's own, I feel a little bit like a fraud because I am not, in fact, one of Connecticut's <laughs> own uh, in terms of, I know many, there are there are people here who have been here since like the 1600s, okay. where their families have, not, not, not actually you. Um, and if you have been here since the 1600s, I want to talk to you because that's a great book. Um, but anyway, uh, so I, I'm from the West Coast originally. My father is British. My mother uh, is from California, although she is uh, the most unlikely Californian. You just think of a Californian girl and just picture her opposite, and that is my mother. <laughs> so. I grew up, uh, we were the, we went up near Seattle. Uh, we were kind of the weird family. Uh, people are always asking me, so you have this MBA in finance. So how did you end up writing books? Uh, and it's really kind of the other way around. How did this really weird bookish kid uh, who only ever wanted to write historical fiction, uh, how did I end up, you know, coming east to the east and getting an MBA in finance? And how did that and it's really the other way around. Why did I do all that when I should have just been writing books from the beginning? 
Um, but it all goes back to this childhood I had very, we were, you know, everyone else sort of, my, my pop culture references are, are sort of nil. Uh, so I'm, I'm always having to sort of hit up my husband for like, well, what music were you listening to during this time? Because I'm really not really sure. Uh, I, I actually made a terrible, I'm not even going to tell you, I made a very embarrassing error. I thought that a very well-known song had been sung by Fleetwood Mac and not Journey. Uh, and, and, and my mind was blown like all these years. So uh, we grew up, I mean, my friends, so we went to, for our annual, uh, annual summer vacation, everyone else got to go to um, such as there are beaches uh, in Washington state. They're a bit heavily uh it's like Maine but with even colder water because the Pacific <laughs> comes down from Alaska so uh so but people would go there they would you know like Maine people like we're going to the beach darn it uh so people would go to the beach they would maybe fly to Hawaii we would go for a fun field week at the Ashland Oregon Shakespeare Festival <laughs> uh which from the time I was five years old I was so excited the first time we went because I was like you know, a festival. There's going to be like pony rides, and there's going to be like a Ferris wheel. But no, it was it was plays. Uh, it was in this beautiful um, replica Elizabethan theater that had been built in 1936 by a man named Angus Bomer, uh, who just thought it would be a really good idea to build a replica of the Globe Theater in the middle of the Badlands of Southern Oregon. <laughs> Uh, and he did, and it actually turned out to be a very, very successful Shakespeare festival. They had some of the best actors, Shakespearean actors uh, in the country come there. Although my father, who grew up in England, recently told me, he's like, oh, yeah, you know, when I was growing up, we would go to Stratford. And, uh, you know, I saw uh, Laurence Olivier as Coriolanus. So and I'm like, are you kidding me? Uh, so anyway, he had a much better uh, Shakespeare background. So this was just sort of... You know, this was a bit second rate for him, but we went anyway. Um, the 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 uh, local hospital there actually is very proud of the fact that they're one of the only hospitals in the world still treating broadsword wounds. Uh, they take they take their authenticity very seriously. I was five years old. I saw the Tempest and Taming of the Shrew. I was not taken to see Richard III uh, because the subject matter was deemed a little too adult for me uh, at age five. So I stayed back in the Motel 6. Um, we spent all our money on Shakespeare and opera and our clothes from the Sears catalog growing up. Uh, so lest you have any misapprehensions about my lifestyle. Uh, so and yes, and then in the, in the winter, we would go to the Seattle Opera. And I first started uh, getting season tickets to the Seattle Opera at age seven, which is really obnoxious. And what's even more obnoxious, the first opera was Don Giovanni, uh, which again, with the adult subject matter. So if there is a lot of sex in my books, you can blame my parents. Um, I remember at, literally asking my father, that they were explaining Don Giovanni to me, uh, which was actually on Met Opera Radio today. If anyone, anyone else listened to <laughs> only me, Met Opera Radio. Uh, that's why they kicked it off the broadcast series, and now I have to use the web app. Uh, but anyway, so Don Giovanni, again, adult subject matter. I had to ask my father, because I was not quite clear on this, what exactly is a mistress? <laughs> so I asked my father this, and my father being British, and you know, you don't, you know, you, you tell it like it is, you treat your adult, you treat your children as adults because you don't know how to interact with children at all. Um, <laughs> so he gave me a very adult answer, which was, well, it's a bit like a girlfriend, only you pay her. Uh, <laughs> and, and this made complete sense to me. So we went, uh, you know, I remember going to the Chia de Lammermoor at age eight, and someone, this was exciting, someone called in a bomb threat. Uh, so, uh, so we were kind of enacting the mad scene ourselves in that one, uh, as we all fled for the exits. But, um, so I had a great time growing up with all this, but I was kind of sitting by myself at the cafeteria table, um, as you can imagine. Uh, and, and, and this was obviously, you know, it was, it was a bit difficult interacting with everybody growing up, but the great thing about becoming an adult is that all these things that make you so weird as a kid sitting by yourself at the end of the cafeteria table are the things that give you your superpowers. If you say, go into writing books for a living. So I uh, would like, I'd like to say that there are three main things that I kind of gathered from this background. 
uh, that all go into my books. Number one uh, is history. Uh, all of these plays and operas, and we would also do sort of the Gilbert and Sullivan and the, you know, and 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 uh, the more modern musicals. Uh, all of them are very grounded in history and not history as sort of teaching you history, but history is just it's the scenery. It is where it takes place. You're not being explained in history. You are simply experiencing it. And my books, uh, I, you know, I, I love a good narrative nonfiction. Uh, that is what I devour in my spare time to give me all that background knowledge that I bring to my novels. When I come to my own novels, I want you to feel as if you have just been dropped in place in this historical setting. I'm not going to explain things to you. You're going to absorb it uh, by what people are saying and doing and everything around them. Because to me, that is what novels are for. Novels are to show you what it means to be a human being living in periods of historical change or major historical events. Uh, so there's that. There's that sense of history that is always in my books. Uh, number two uh, is I love a good love story, and I am not ashamed to admit it. Mm -hmm. All of these wonderful stories that I grew up uh, witnessing largely and then reading as I became an avid reader, they all had as their, uh, as I guess their, the, 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 the pivot around which the story turns is always a love story. Uh, and I've spent some time, you know, it, it, was this chicken or egg? Was I always susceptible to love stories? Or was it because of this imprinting when I was a kid? And I think it's a little of both. But also, you know, the, the love story plays such a terrific role in these stories because it, it raises the stakes for us. You know, when we love someone deeply and passionately, uh, it means that we are often forced into difficult choices as the world demands things of us. Uh, that, uh, you know, our love for someone else pulls us in a different direction. So that conflict between love and duty, uh, love and, and, and our obligation to society, to our families, when that comes in conflict, we are torn apart. And that makes a great narrative. And so that's the second thing. The third thing, and, and this is sort of something I realized, and this is a little more on the technical writing side, um, but having been exposed to so much, I guess what you might call performative storytelling growing up, uh, is that I always like to be in the scene. Uh, I don't like explainers. Um, I don't like sort of, if, if I'm going to be talking, my character is going to be you know, relating their life story. It's going to come at it, it, whatever snippets I give you are going to come in the form of scenes, things that have happened, and they're often going to be either in the form of a dialogue with another character or a dialogue with you, the reader. Uh, if, somebody, if you've read my books, you know that there is a sense often of the narrator or the, the point of view character interacting with you saying, well, you already know who this is, you know, you, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, you all know that this, you know that, and, 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 and just having that sense of a dialogue with the reader uh, allows me uh, to sort of give that exposition uh, a bit more of a personal quality. Uh, it allows you to remain in the scene and not have to sort of, uh, you know, go through exposition. We're in the scene. We're on the stage. This is a performance. Uh, and it's, I never sort of, I didn't really realize I was doing that uh, until a couple of books in. Uh, when, whenever I was like going to like explain what the character was thinking, I'm like, no, you show it. You do a scene. You show what the character is thinking rather than explain what the character is thinking. So it requires you to do a little work sometimes because you have to interpret uh, what the character is thinking. But um, I think that that makes it uh, a richer experience for you. I hope that you're getting more out of it because you're involved in this in a play with the characters. Anyway, I'm getting a little off course here. Uh, but uh, so I have all this growing up and, and all this influence and all kind of comes pouring into my books when I finally got around to uh, to writing them. Uh, I, at that point, had three children uh, and a fourth uh, then came uh, while I was uh, trying to launch a writing career. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and when I started writing books, uh, I uh, was drawing a little bit on not 
just all this stuff that I had uh, as uh, as a child, but also uh, when I moved to the East Coast after college. So uh, I had not actually intended to come East. I considered myself a West Coast girl, but uh, it was like in the early 90s, uh, there was the big recession. There were not a lot of jobs available. And literally the only job offer I got was New York City. So I packed my bags, moved across the country to New York City. It was only gonna be a temporary thing. Uh, after that, I was gonna maybe spend two years in New York max and then go to like grad school or find something else to do, somehow move back to the West Coast. But then I met the man who became my husband. His parents are in this room right now. Uh, so I had better watch my tongue. Uh, but, you know, they've heard it all before. I like to say I love to throw them under the bus in these talks and, and kind of blame everything on them. But in fact, I get a lot of my cool family stories from people sitting right over there. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to be writing my next book soon. So if you've got any more, keep them coming. Uh, so I moved to the East Coast. I meet my husband. We fall passionately in love. Uh, and within a few weeks, you know, I'm, I'm, he's taking me home to meet his mother. Uh, and so I want to make a very good impression uh, on this woman, the mother of my boyfriend. So um, I am a little nervous, but you know, okay, there she is, this, you know, lovely, uh, you know, lovely woman, uh, beautiful home. And I walk in and I so I just envelop her in a great big West Coast hug, like you do. It's so funny. In the East, I say this, and people kind of get it, but when I'm in the South and I say I gave her a great big hug, there's this audible, like, gasp, like the air just, oh, no. And I said, uh, Caroline, it's so great to meet you. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we, that that you got. So, and, and, and she's, uh, we, we are deeply in love we now just love each other so much but i just remember feeling that i had definitely overstepped a little bit <laughs> and and but i'm i'm i am quick of wit uh and i said i mean mrs mrs williams uh and and from then on and the, actually no we are very close the very first thing she said to me when i called her up to say that we had gotten engaged was now you can call me Caroline. <laughs> and so that was when I knew I was part of the family. But I learned so much about the culture in the East Coast. When I, I came out, I was a complete fish out of water. But luckily, I was an anthropology major. So I had the toolbox to figure out what was going on. Uh, for example, we would go to uh, the beach club. And this was a beach club that, uh, you know, uh, my mother-in-law's family had been going to for a few generations now. And we would we would sit on this boardwalk. And um, uh, some gentleman would come by, and we'd be drinking our rum south sides. Uh, and he would stop by, and my he and my mother-in-law would start chatting and, uh, and, 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 and it was a very convivial conversation. It was very sort of, you know, uh, you know, scooters off to Princeton to play lacrosse kind of a conversation, you know, all these little status markers taking place there and they would go back and forth and then, you know, uh, they would go off, he would go off to talk to the next table. And, um, and my mother-in-law would turn to me and be like, I never liked him. <laughs> and, and I was like, wow, because it really felt like you knew each other really well and you were very close to him. What I didn't understand then, and I came very quickly to realize, was that when you have these generations interacting and rubbing together over long periods of time, over the generations, parents and children and cousins and aunts and uncles, you have to find a way to get along. I mean, your personal dislike of so-and-so uh, is just, you know, it's just a, a moment in time. And you need to make sure that Scooter gets into the club when it's his turn to, like, you know, start a family. And, and, and you need to make sure that your own kid gets into the club. So we all find a way to get along. So fast forward to, I have written, you know, some more historical novels. Uh, and my editor was like, so can you remember how well A Hundred Summers did? Uh, you know, you're on the beach and it takes place over the summer and there's a love story and the word summer is the title. Um, can you write another one of those? And I was like, oh, well, I did have this idea for a book set on kind of a fictionalized version of Fisher's Island. And she said, done. Uh, so uh, now I had not, there is some, some family threads that connect us to Fisher's Island, but I won't go into that 
But I, you know, I, I kind of had these stories filter down and I was fascinated because it seemed to me like, you know, if you're thinking about, especially that sort of mid-century kind of heyday of that, uh, you know, that sort of Fisher's Island elite uh, population. And this was like, you know, this was really just the, the nexus of that. And I thought, I, you know, and I love cultures. I love these little micro cultures. All of my books at some level are about some little micro culture of people uh, who are interacting together. Uh, and, 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 and so Fishers to me was really fascinating, but I knew I needed to do a couple of things. Number one, I had to kind of fictionalize it. Like I said, for the most important reason uh, is because Let's face it, face it, the Fishers Islanders have a lot more money than I do and can afford better lawyers. <laughs> so that was number one. But the other reason is that I like to, I like, I can never write one of those very worthy biographical novels where you take, you know, a, a forgotten historical figure and, and novelize their story. I can't do that because my imagination gets the better of me. And I'm like, you know what would really make a good story? Is it this? I like to sort of take a composite of different people, different characters, and bring them together and create uh, a person with her own voice and her own personality. That's just the way I work and the way my imagination works. Uh, so I thought a fictional Winthrop Island will give me a little more latitude to work here. I can be inspired by the geography and by certain you know, uh, you know, institutions there, certain families, certain people, but I don't have to keep to the facts. I can create a story that is uh, something more than the facts, that really brings alive to you what is going on here. So that's what I did with the Summer Wives. Uh, there are a few little incidents and, and families who are loosely inspired by real things that happen and real people who live there. But what I really wanted to do was kind of delve into that culture. Uh, and uh, then, of course, we had to figure out what the name. So a lot of people have come to me and said, so The Summer Wives, I didn't want to pick this book up because I had an idea of what it was about based on the title, and it turned out to be completely different. Uh, and the same with, I would say, my second uh, Winthrop Island novel, The Beach at Summerlee, a Cold War thriller uh, that happens to take place on Winthrop Island again. But here's the deal. Uh, the marketing department thinks it's very, very important that you, the reading public, understand that this is a summer novel. Uh, so that is why we end up with uh, titles like The Summer Wives and The Beach at Summer Lake. I thought I was doing a little end run with The Beach at Summer Lake because I named the estate Summer Lake. I was like, you can call it Summer Lake. And then the marketing department said, well, what's a Summer Lake? <laughs> And I said, well, uh, if you um, care to read the novel uh, that you're going to be marketing to the world, you'll find out that the estate is called Summerly. They didn't think that was gonna, so they threw a beach in there too, just to make sure the point is very clear. This is a summer novel, even though it's really about Cold War spies. Um, so anyway, so I wrote that and, and then um, I moved to a different publisher uh, and I wanted to, I wanted to explore more about Winthrop Island. Um, but uh, we thought we wanted to do a little bit of a pivot. Uh, and I, this actually kind of, you know, dovetailed with what I was becoming a little interested in, some ideas that I had. Like, well, why don't we bring it a more contempt, bring it up to the, to the present day. And I said, well, I do happen to have a couple of ideas in my head that have to do with uh, some articles I had been reading. Uh, now, as you know, I'm very fascinated by the interaction of present and past and generations and how the mistakes and the secrets of previous generations come back to inform our own lives. And I'm sure we can all think of those incidents in our own past and our own family stories. Uh, so uh, I had read some articles, and, and what this is, I love this. As an anthropology major, I found this fascinating. So with the rise of like 23 and me, and all these DNA websites, you have a lot of people finding out that the family tree they thought they had <laughs> is not quite the same in every branch that they always assumed. Maybe there's a couple of new branches they never knew about. Uh, maybe uh, they actually come from an entirely different trunk. Uh, I had no idea. Uh, and and they're one of the one of the little um, terms they used. 
uh, kind of grabbed me a little bit. So they're actually literally hiring now therapists at these places to walk people there. They, they get an unexpected result. If they get what's called a paternity incident, <laughs> which I think is a great word um, for what happened. Apparently it happens a lot more than people cough men realized. Uh, <laughs> that in fact, a lot of people are not actually, the father is not the actual biological father of the child. This happens in a surprise, I mean, in some, you know, like, like up to 30% in like certain, yes, I know, I was shocked as well. Um, so it is apparently, they even found one, I think they were doing, I think when they were doing all the research, when they found the bones of Richard III, so they were doing all this DNA stuff to ascertain, and of course, you can't ask the queen for a DNA sample, um, you know, so you have to kind of triangulate a bit, so they just got samples of people who were descended from various lines, and they reconstructed the family tree until they there is a paternity incident way back, I think it's sort of the Plantagenet era, but there is a paternity incident in the royal family tree, which, again, very fascinating. But anyway, uh, back to the story. So I found this really fascinating. And, 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 and for me, like, you know, it, it kind of gets, as you know, many of my books deal with paternity incidents, though not so called. Uh, so uh, I had two ideas. So one of the stories that I read in one of these sort of long form articles it was really fascinating. It was about one of these 23 meat companies. And, and they profiled a woman. They had several profiles, but one of them really grabbed me. I thought, this is the Beatrice book right here. Uh, so it turns out her um, she knew that her mother had been adopted out of an Irish orphanage in the 1950s, which if you know, like that in itself is fascinating. So if you know anything about the Irish orphanages, uh, I mean, just the way these uh, unwed mothers were treated, I mean, it was it was brutal. Uh, so that's a whole story there. But then it turned out the woman, her mother, had actually been married. And the reason she gave birth in this Irish orphanage is because the baby was not her husband's child. And they traced back the real father. It turned out he had been a manager in some hotel in some, and I can't even remember what, because I didn't want to read the article anymore after that. I didn't want to go back to it. I wanted to create my own story, but it was somewhere kind of British Empire-ish, and I couldn't remember which. And I, so I thought, oh, that's a great story. Now, why would someone need to find out their family history? Uh, and then I came across a really interesting story. I was, I think it was the guy who wrote um, The Force Whisperer, I think. And it turned out, so he had gone a little bit of background on me, personal information here. I don't tend to give out tons of personal information, but what you need to know about me, I don't like mushrooms. In fact, here's a good mother-in-law story. <laughs> uh, one of my very first dinners, I came to my, 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 my then boyfriend uh, to hit their house for the weekend. And, um, and his mother had gone to a great deal of trouble uh, for a lovely dinner. She had gone and, and, and made this um, delicious, um, well, I'm assuming it was delicious, wild mushroom soup. And I had dutifully spooned as much broth as I possibly could. And sort of the, the, the bowls had gone in uh, to be washed. And she looks down and she goes, oh, somebody doesn't like mushrooms. <laughs> Said that gave me sorry. I tried to muscle it down, but the broth was really good. You know, the cream. Uh, so, um, so I do not like mushrooms. So I'm always pouncing on any any stories out there that, as we all do, you know how you always try to find those stories that like reinforce your own beliefs? Well, my belief that mushrooms are fundamentally bad, they're a fungus, don't eat them. The author of The Horse Whisperer is out foraging for wild mushrooms in the Scottish borders, and I could have told him, don't do it. Uh, guess what happens? Death cat mushroom. And he ends up needing a kidney transplant, and the person who gives him the kidney is his own daughter. And I was like, oh. So uh, creating a story, a single mother uh, sends her child off to summer camp for the very first time. Uh, and he's uh, 11 years old, never been away from home, but she finally sends him off. And she's got a week of wonderful free time. She's never had this before. And then the call comes in from the camp 
her son is right now on a helicopter being airlifted to the hospital um, because he, on a dare, ingested a death cap mushroom, and now he's going to need a kidney transplant. Well, there's a little problem. Uh, one of the problems is that um, she has no contact with the father of this child. In fact, he doesn't even know the child exists. And to make matters even more complicated and more fun, uh, he is now, has since become, a world famous singer songwriter. And he's pretty hot because, you know, we got to have some like this. <laughs> so she's got to reach out uh, to this guy uh, that she hasn't spoken to since that fateful summer when they had fallen in love. And then something, of course, terrible happens at the end of that summer. And so he's never known that he has this child. But uh, she also sends her DNA into you know, one of these 23 and meetings because she needs the maximum number of available kidneys. And that's when she discovers that her mother was in fact adopted out of an Irish orphanage uh, in 1952. And that the father of this child, as we discover in this parallel narrative that happens uh, as we explore the story of these grandparents, a man that she met, he's the manager of Shepherd's Hotel in Cairo, uh, one of the most glamorous places in the world. And it turns out, well, she's got her own story of how she came to be married to this older British diplomat and ends up in this unhappy marriage in Shepherd's Hotel in the fall of 1951. But it turns out that the manager of the hotel has his own secrets and his own reasons for having this affair with her. Uh, so when I decided to place that part of the novel in Cairo, I did it because Cairo is a, a fascinating place. We're talking about Egypt at a moment when uh, it is shortly to undergo revolution. Uh, we have all kinds of, this is sort of the, the seeds of what is happening in the Middle East even today, as we know. Uh, and as I burrowed further into the research for this, I kind of started out with books about Cairo and the Middle East. And then I said, okay, now I need to turn to some memoirs because that's where you really understand, again, what it was like to be a human being living in a certain period. And I knew there's a lot going on in Cairo. But what was interesting, the memoirs I discovered, almost all of them uh, that are we are available now, were written by <coughs> Jewish people whose families had lived in Cairo, sometimes all the way back to, say, when they had fled from Spain during the Inquisition and had found safety in Egypt. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, the same things are happening in Egypt to Jews that had happened to Jews in Germany in the 1930s. Property is taken away. Legal rights are taken away. Uh, money is taken away. So one by one, they leave. Uh, and many of them go to mainland Europe, and many of them, of course, go to Israel. And these are mostly the memoirs that have come down. It's this experience, this sense of why does my country no longer want me? Why am I suddenly being kicked out? And the same thing that happens in Germany, where you wait and wait, and you think, well, this is just a temporary madness and it won't end. I've lived here for generations, for hundreds of years. Why are they kicking me out? Until finally you realize that you have to leave. So that, uh, without too much, uh, giving too much away, is kind of the backstory to what is happening in Cairo and how um, my main character, Mallory, uh, her mother ended up being born in an Irish orphanage uh, in 1952, shortly after uh, the famous January fires of 1952. In January of 1952, um, burnt most of, um, I guess you could say, British colonial Cairo uh, to, uh, to the ground, including uh, Shepherd's Hotel. Uh, so these stories work in parallel, and as we start to realize all the threads that connect them, uh, it all comes together as they always do in my books, uh, with an unusual twist. Uh, so uh, I would say that the contemporary story takes the, the front seat in this one, um, but to me, the story of these grandparents working their way uh, to find happiness in a very 
uh, you know, tumultuous period in history in a very tumultuous part of the world uh, was fascinating to me. And certainly uh, the events that have taken place uh, in the Middle East, uh, certainly in the past year, have made have given me a lot of context. And I hope that will give you as well a little bit of historical context uh, to what is going on today. So I'm going to bring that to a close because I try not to give away too many smileys. But let me just say, I just on a personal note, the love story between my two main characters. And if you, who's read The Summer Wives? Oh my goodness, this is really like my home crowd here. This is great. So if you remember Clay Monk, uh, so he was like this kind of sweet guy. He'd been to World War II and he was in love with Isabel Fisher, who is Miranda's stepsister in The Summer Wives. But they never quite uh, managed to get together. Uh, so Clay has his married someone else and has three children, three daughters. Well, one of those daughters is the mother of Monk Adams, who is my main character, my singer songwriter in uh, uh, in uh, Husbands and Lovers. So he is the grandson of Clay Monk, uh, and Monk is not his Monk is his middle name that he goes by. Uh, and, and Mallory is my main character. So the love story between Monk and Mallory to me is, was one of the most, I want to say the word that keeps it, one of the most joyful love stories uh, that I have ever written. These two are just, they were two characters who when I, as soon as I started writing them, I knew them perfectly. You know, in my historical narrative, it took a while to get to know. They're all hiding so many secrets uh, in that historical narrative. So it took me a little while to get to know them and love them. But Monk and Mallory, I just adore. The very first scene, uh, if you read, you know, when first, of course you will all read the book. Uh, but the first time you really meet Monk is, um, it's kind of a flashback scene. Uh, they're at boarding school together. It's like ninth grade. And he's like, you know, the popular guy, the football player, and he's really good looking and everybody loves him. And she's kind of, uh, you know, she's like this Catholic girl and working class family. And, 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 and her mom drops her off at the boarding school for the, because she, uh, she, goes home for the weekend and she boards during the week and, and Monk's being dropped off at the same time. And Monk just walks in and I just fell in love with him at that moment. He was just himself in this wonderful way. So I hope you will have that uh, that same sense of connection I did to these, these characters. I still think about them. They in fact have the cameos in the book that I just finished that will be out next summer. Uh, so we were gonna keep going with Winter Bible at this point. So. Enough about that. Just quick, uh, any questions you may have, uh, I'm happy to answer. This is my very first book talk for this book. So I would love to know what interests you about all of this, what questions you might have. I answered them all. <laughs> Uh, so I, I've kind of, yes, I've always wanted to write, uh, and I mean, I was, my mother uh, taught us to read when we were very, very little, like I was three years old, and I'd be like, in, you know, piecing through my little nursery rhyme books and everything, uh, so I've always been a reader, always wanted to write, I would write long, you know, stories about horses, um, uh, growing up, uh, moving on to, you know, I, I just, I read all those sort of classic uh, you know, children's series uh, from Little House of Perry to The Black Stallion. Uh, and, you know, here's my first true love was The Black Stallion. Uh, and Almanzo Wilder, but um, <laughs> who also was really good with horses, so you could imagine. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was always writing, always writing. Um, but I think that, um, so we kind of reversed the the, the birth order dynamics in my family. My, my older sister was the rebel and I was the, was like the good kid. You know, I was the one who tried to appease everybody to keep the peace right mm -hmm. in the family. So I was always trying to do what was expected of me and to, to succeed, to make them proud of me. So um, it's a lot easier to do that if you go into the finance world. Than, uh, <laughs> I mean, like yeah. writing, as my father would often tell me in his, his British way, um, many are called few are chosen. Yeah. <laughs> so that was super encouraging. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I, I didn't have the guts to do it really because you're really like, 
it's still a heart. You put a book out and, you know, people say things about it. They're just completely untrue, you know, and, and you just have to like, you have to keep that faith in what you're doing and, and what you're trying to say and the way that you're saying it. And screw everyone else. And, 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 but I wasn't ready to do that uh, when I was in my 20s, even in my early 30s, uh, until I had kids. And all of a sudden, Speaks were no longer as, like, I could crash and burn at writing, but I still had the most important job, uh, which was my kids. And my kids didn't care. They would still love me and need me, even if it turns out um, I didn't have any writing talent. That was always a fear, right? Like, like you think, like, you know, like, remember, like, American Idol, and they do the auditions, and the guy's like, my family says I am the best singer in the world, and he gets up and starts singing, and you're like, oh, my God, your family must love you so much. <laughs> like, I didn't want to be, like, that person. Like, maybe I have no talent. Maybe I can't write a right story. So it wasn't until I had kids that I really had the courage to put my work out. They just send it out to editors and agents and have it be rejected and rejected and rejected until finally I figured out what I was doing. I figured out, how, you know, what makes it. I was actually drawing a lot of my anthropology background uh, and like, well, what makes it? What, what, what are the human elements that connect us to certain stories? And you know, there's this sort of like in like the romance world, and they're like, they talk about tropes, you know, oh, that's the, you know, the Cinderella trope and the this trope. I would say it's more like they're fables, aren't they? These are the stories that generation after generation, going back, you know, thousands and thousands of years, these are the stories we connect to. So what interests me as an anthropologist is why. Why is the redemption arc so important to us that is in every single religion out there? Why do we care so much about redemption, sin and redemption? You know, why why do certain love stories, uh, you know, the Romeo and Juliet story, you know, why do these stories appeal to us so much? So once I sort of started thinking like an anthropologist and then sort of translating that, okay, well, how do I make this story, how do I tell it in the most compelling way possible uh, that keeps the reader wanting to turn the pages? And I kind of figured that out a bit after some trial and error. And that was my first book overseas. Uh, and, and then I felt, yeah, then, then all of a sudden, like, I get this. And I, I feel like I have this story to tell uh, and stories uh, to tell. And so here I am, all these books later, uh, still, um, still writing. And gosh, so much happier than I was, like, building spreadsheets. <laughs> I mean, let's face it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. One, one more, more question. Here? One more question. Did you happen to be able to see the movie American Fiction? I did. <laughs> that was so good. I know. I was la my my husband, who's been through all this with me, like he was laughing. There was so much about that that was so just the publishing world. Uh, yeah, and I can't imagine. Yes. Yeah. No. That's really good. And it's interesting because, uh, as some of you know, I also write novels with uh, my two partners in crime, uh, Karen White and Lauren Willig. And if you are not already reading their books, please yes. do, they're amazing. Uh, we have our fifth novel together that is coming out in November. And our previous ones have always had like historical storyline or a couple of different historical storylines. This one is all set in the present day, although there is a story in the past that is referenced, but all the action takes place in the present day. And it's like, it's about three, writers who get together to write a book <laughs> but they hate each other they're making their friendship for social media but it turns out there's a reason they're all gathered in this scottish castle and it has to do with the um uh owner of the castle who is like uh, this actually uh Brooklyn male author um, who is kind of every stereotypical Brooklyn male author uh, all <laughs> rolled into one. And it's a total bit like, I, I, one of the reasons I love American fiction was because I'd just written this like literary satire about oh. the publishing world. And and so uh, it really, I was like, yes, you know, these are these things that we kind of, sometimes we have a little, we want to get off our chests about this crazy business we're in. But um, but yes, so that's my literary satire that's coming out. So I loved American fiction. I thought that it just was so pitch 
perfect. It was dead on. Any more? If any more, I think we can hopefully address those in the signing line because I'm sure you all bought copies of the book, right? Because right. my youngest decided she wanted to go to boarding school. Uh, so I now have one kid in college, one starting a master's program and one in boarding school. So please buy all the books. I, I, my backlist is also available if there's, if there's any new fits. So yes, thank you. I know.